Hello and welcome to uh, the newly rebranded The Auteur Limits. Uh, and, and this particular strand is hereby known as A Fuller Understanding. Uh, a, 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 a guided tour through the, the life and works of Sam, Samuel Fuller. And with me as always is uh, my co-host Robert Beams. Hello Rob. Hello Craig, how are you doing? <coughs> I'm good, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we've, um, if you've seen our previous pod, the Kurosawa cast, was it Kurosawa Cast or Kurosawa Pod? I can't remember. It's Kurosawa Cast. It's Kurosawa Cast. <laughs> That's a good, good sign. Good start. Well we only branded. finished it two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, you'd know that, that we had a little gimmick uh, going on for our first podcast series, whereby I, as a uh, a, a teacher, a, a film teacher at university, had somehow never seen the Kira Kurosawa film until late last year. And Rob, being a, a fan, was was taking me through the world of Akira Kurosawa. So we've decided we're going to carry on working through uh, auteur filmographies, um, mainly because my wife came up with a great pun for our for our title, uh, our YouTube channel title. Uh, and this time it's Sam Fuller. Now, this is slightly different, this one, in as much as I've not seen all of Sam Fuller's film and Rob's seen a handful too. Uh, but um, I'm right in saying that um, you, you stumbled across a couple of his films on Criterion channel and hadn't really heard of him yeah uh, i think you i think you might have even recommended i watch steel helmet i think yeah that's been. right and uh, i think it was possibly leaving criterion channel one month and you said you should give that a watch so i watched at that point steel helmet and shock corridor and i think maybe one of the other ones crimson kimono um, crimson kimono yeah and i think they were all maybe leaving the channel at the same time and i watched all of them uh, and i really like them uh they're kind of i don't know exactly we were discussing this pr pre-recording the other day but like um I don't know exactly the designation of which of his films were possibly B movies originally, or because there's this thing with a lot of um, B movies from the sort of 40s and 50s where a lot of them have been subsequently reevaluated and then become much more influential and respected and long, long living than the A pictures that were originally around at the time because the B pictures. Uh, were places where directors could be more experimental, working with smaller budgets. They were kind of under the radar. The studio was really trying to sell the big A pictures, and the B pictures were sort of just in that sort of package, weren't they? And they kind of they kind could, of get away yeah. with things. And I they... don't know with with Sam Fuller which of those ones were Bs and which were As, but there's a very sort of like B movie cheap genre vibe to Sam Fuller in a kind of cool way. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, Sam Fuller is like huge. He's not. I mean, it's. I, I don't really know quite how well he, he is known, but he's hugely respected uh, amongst filmmakers. Um, so much like when we did the, the Kurosawa cast, Rob had two books that we, he was drawing from. I've been looking at um, Sam Fuller's autobiography, A Third Face, uh, My Tale of Writing, Fighting and Filmmaking. And also uh, I've been looking at um, this book here, Samuel Fuller, If You Die, I'll Kill You, um, by uh, Lisa Dombrowski, which kind of fills in that Donald Ritchie space on um, on this on this series. Um, and she's very helpfully kind of uh, in the uh, first chapter on his films has kind of explained a lot of that B A B designation. Um, so Samuel Fuller kind of sits in this kind of... Um, liminal space if you like um i didn't really know much about we'd all heard the terms a and b pictures um but from reading this what it seems like is that um distributors and, and studios basically had lists of films available to theater goers who were booking their double bills the a pictures which they decided which ones are a the one with stars the ones with large budgets where the um Cinemas would have to uh, send a load of uh, a percentage of the profits back to the studios after they showed them. And B pictures, where the cinemas would book the B pictures for a set price. And then the um, cinemas would keep any ticket sales. Um, and so um, the idea being that if you, you pre-sold to enough cinemas, you knew exactly how much money was coming in. You could make a film for probably the upper limit of about... Um, one hundred thousand dollars without any stars, usually a genre picture, um, but you could guarantee your profit and your return on those. Um, but what I hadn't particularly realised was that these 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 lines were quite fluid, and depending on um, 
critical and commercial response, these films can change designation. So, you know, a, a big a, a film can start out as a big A picture um, and audiences not respond to it. And then all of a sudden they go, right, we'll, we'll shove that down to B status. And similarly, um, uh, a, um, a B picture might get a load of critical response or be a bit of a sleeper hit and um, all of a sudden become a first run, a, uh, you know, an A picture that um, sort of takes off and wheels. I'll speak a little bit more about how that kind of fits in with um, his first film, I Shot Jesse James, because um, that's the film we're going to be discussing today. Yeah. Um, but do, should we do a little bit of biographical detail to begin with? To give a, yeah. I, th I think it really kind of informs um, a lot of what he's about, basically. Yeah, for sure. I think what I just want to say on the AB picture thing is the ones I've seen so far don't really have any stars, even if maybe some of them are among his higher budget, maybe even A picture work. Um, I remember when I watched Steel Helmet, um, I can't remember if it was Gary Cooper or John Wayne, but the studio wanted one of those people to be the lead and he kind of fought to get like a non-star. So I don't know as well how much of him not having stars and we'll figure it out. Maybe you know the answers from your reading. How much of him not having these stars is because he's making low budget B pictures and how much he kind of didn't really want starry actors as well, which is sort of an interesting thing. But yeah, I'm really interested to, yeah. to dive in. Um, yeah, so I mean, so Sam Fuller was kind of from a very early age was working. So at the age of 11, his father died and his mother moves him and his, I think it was seven brothers and sisters to New York city to live in a small apartment and they all have to get work. And he starts off as a newsie selling, going off and buying a few newspapers and selling newspapers on the corner um, and sort of hustling and grifting and kind of fighting for his corner amongst all the other newspaper sellers and that kind of thing. Um, and he becomes very enamored by the newspaper business to the point where he kind of, on one of his regular routes, he's always walking past the um, uh, the, 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 the printing, the, the presses, if you like. So he, he kind of talks his way into visiting this factory um, one day when he's about 13. And he talks his way in past the security and kind of immediately falls in love with the whole place. And kind of tries to get a um, a copy uh, a copy boy job, sort of like an office runner, um, and kind of grifts his way into that and starts working within the newspaper office itself. And he's running around, meeting everybody, getting as involved as he can while still at school. So sort of going to school, um, leaving school at two in the afternoon, going straight to the newspaper, working, speaking to everybody, and kind of taking in the newspaper business, if you like. And and during this time, he uh, he he also kind of he's he's very you know he's got the gift of the gab, and he kind of manages to um, blag his way into the office uh, of the um, the editor Arthur Brisbane, uh, and this is the New York Journal, um, and he he's kind of found out that he shouldn't be there by the editor, but the editor kind of likes his moxie. And takes his, takes him on as his own personal copy boy, um, and the New York Journal at this time is kind of owned by William Randolph Hearst. So at the age of fourteen, fifteen, he is kind of basically in the car with Arthur Brisbane, going backwards and forwards, and in the office, and, and to his house. And William Randolph Hearst is popping in every now and then, and he's kind of seeing behind the scenes of of, of the influence that. Citizen Kane is having on the newspaper uh, from a very very young age um, but he's not particularly happy with this um, he doesn't he, it's good that he's up high but what he really wants to do is is actually write the news so he uh, at the age of 16 he kind of he um, he he kind of moves sideways to a much smaller yellow press paper uh, under the promise that at the age of 17 he can get his first crime beat and become a, 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 a reporter. Um, and the average age for like a crime reporter is, is much higher. It's sort of 21 kind of thing. Because uh, it's dangerous work. Like you, you mix with, you know, the criminals and the drug addicts and uh, sort of the, the, the lower echelons of society, sort of getting information and that kind of thing. Um, but he, he's desperate to do it. So he, he takes this job um, at this other newspaper and the promise that at 17 he'll get a uh, crime beat. 
at which point he is paired up with, and I can't remember her name. I haven't written it down, which is terrible. Oh, no, I have. Uh, Rhea Gar, I think her name is, who is the mother of John Houston. So right. like he's on on his seventeenth birthday, he starts his um his crime beat um with Rhea, with with Rhea Gar, who shows him the ropes and how to do this whole. So he's in and out of all these murder scenes and morgues and um like you know the the mean streets of New York at the age of seventeen, learning how to to write a sensational story for the for the Yellow Press, and he's still at school at this point. Um, and then. Uh, and we're talking about like the underworld during prohibition. We're talking speakeasies and uh, going on to, off to see executions and things like that. Um, can, and I, can I ask, do you know from your reading of his biography, um, was he kind of, he's doing this during being at school. Is he also like a good student or is he kind of like sacking off school and doing this stuff? He's sacking off school and doing this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, he's seeing all sorts of, all sorts of stuff. He only does that for a year, and at the age of eighteen, he decides that he needs to see more of the country than just um, New York. He's also sort of drawing cartoons at this point and selling cartoons. So, at the age of eighteen, he kind of he hits the road with his typewriter in his backpack and goes off to, to be a freelance copywriter from town to town, looking for crime stories or whatever stories. Um, and he's visiting like what were called Hoovervilles. They're kind of like the um, shanty towns where all the displaced people from the Depression were going to. And he's meeting loads of people, hearing all sorts of stories, jumping freight trains with hobos, and um, like get, gathering this oral history of of, um, of America basically at the time. And he he kind of speaks quite a lot in his autobiography about the. Um, about his respect for people who live on the fringes like he's not somebody who thinks of everybody as scum he's like this is there's a lot of humanity it's the edge of humanity and these people are living really hard lives you know whether or not they're criminals or, or criminals victims drug addicts what he, he's kind of interested in people and their stories um and he, he sees all sorts of stuff you know he, he go it, like he he um he he also at this point as well as the cartooning starts to take up photography because a lot of people are saying your stories are great but you know we are um you know with with some pictures we could have much more impact you could sell these much wider and he he, he mentions going to a clan meeting and seeing a woman in clan robes breastfeeding as like the moment where he goes i i, I need to be photographing this as well like this is you know, there needs to be a visual representation of all of this. Um, and at the same time, in between sort of meeting people and talking, he, he writes his first novel, a novel called Burn Baby Burn. Amazing. Um, now, my back. You've, uh, you've dropped so he, out he, there. It's so the yellow... a novel called Burn Baby Burn. Can I ask, just because there's been a pause in there, um, this is a lot yeah. of this is from what like an autobiography, his autobiography, right? That he, this is from his autobiography. Yeah. So with with Kurosawa, when I was going through his autobiography, there were definitely points at which you could tell that he was possibly a slightly unreliable narrator, or he was a bit of a a bit of a cantankerous guy, kind of giving his kind of Alan Partridge kind of take on yeah. his life. Do you get any sort of sense from Fuller that this is just unadorned, exactly how it was? Do you get a sense of him as a as a character from this, or where he might be playing fast and loose in any way? I don't have any. I should have had more quotes, but I was really wrapped up in it because he's a really engaging writer. There's a lot of goddamn and summer bitch and that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, but he talks a lot about um, he he's kind of he he uh, hasn't got time for anything. He he talks about being very impatient and wanting every, and and being a big believer in veracity. Um, but he also talks about being a little bit creative and sensationalist with his writing. Um, so that kind of explains a little bit. But you get the idea that he doesn't. Although there are, it's quite you know it's not a biography. They're always a little bit boastful. He's not particularly self-aggrandizing in his in his writing, um, but he is very hard. I mean, another thing to know about him is from the age of 16, 17, he started smoking cigars and he was smoking cigars pretty much constantly. Um, he's a very kind of grizzled, like proto-Sam Pe Peckinpah kind of figure, really. Um, 
yeah, he writes. He, he, 1937, he writes his first script, which I think is called Gangs of New York. Uh, and then he goes on to ghostwrite novels um, and scripts for famous um, writers. He doesn't actually reveal who he wrote for, um, except for Otto Preminger. Uh, and the only reason he says that is because apparently Otto Preminger, in his autobiography, name checks Sam Fuller as having written one of his scripts, ghostwritten one of his scripts. So he's he's doing really well um, up to that point. And then Pearl Harbor happens, and he immediately goes and signs up. Um, how old? How old is he at this point? In 1941. Just let me check. So he was born in 1912. So he's quite old. He's uh, he's 29. So he's, yeah, but he's, still, he's, twenty nine. Press, press, chain, chain, cigar smoking. Press news hounds touring the country of John Houston. You know, working with John Houston's mum on the crime beat, seeing all these executions, writing novels, writing scripts. Now joining the war. Already, yeah. already quite a life there. Even if yes. he didn't do anything else, isn't it? I mean, that is a third of his autobiography so far, and it, it, it's it's really great. And then. Uh, so he, he joins up, and they they ask him to join the kind of propaganda press corps, and he says no, I'm I'm here to fight. And he's repeatedly asked to join and write, and they say, you know, you've got these skills, we could do with you. And he's like, no. Uh, and he ends up in in um, the infantry division, the the big red one. So he's like a frontline soldier from 1942 after he finishes his training, all the way till the end of the war. And he goes through uh, North Africa. He goes through Sicily and Italy. He comes back to Britain for a rest stop where somehow the woman who runs the local convenience shop is Alfred Hitchcock's uh, cousin. And he ends up getting a meeting with Alfred Hitchcock in London for a day during his R&R. &R. This, is, this is one of those truth is strange though fiction scenarios where if you wrote that into a movie, it would just seem the most ridiculously <laughs> contrived connections that he's making here. And then he goes off to um, storm the beaches at Normandy on D-Day. Um, and he talks uh, really very, very openly um, about the horrors of war. It's not a, um, it's not one of these I've seen things man um, kind of cryptic. He talks about, um, he talks about being in Africa and um, one of the, the GIs um, going a little bit going a bit mad killing a whole family uh in the desert and then the um his um co like summer summarily executing the the um the gi and things like that he talks about he talks about being a, he talks about d-day in quite a lot of detail and running backwards and forwards along the beach and at one point seeing like just a mouth floating in the water and i don't even quite understand what that means but like he talked he, there's a lot and lot of detail about the things that he sees there's a story about uh um being on the belgian border and this belgian resistance fight uh fighter with in a motorbike and a sidecar crashing right next to them as they're marching along and in the sidecar is a pregnant woman who's about to give birth and they have to kind of they've been marching for days and all of a sudden they've got this pregnant woman on the side of the road and they have to just deliver this baby um he, he's, there's loads and loads of army stories, but basically he he spends that entire war um, like at the spearhead, um, fighting and at any minute, you know, picking up a couple of injuries, but somehow surviving the whole thing. And lots of people that he was with there not surviving. Um, and then, um, spoiler alert, they end up winning the war. Um, and he comes back and... Um, has that usual kind of difficult time of readjusting, goes home for a bit and um, decides to go out and really have a go at, um, in Hollywood. I think he, he's got a few, fr there's a few friends and a few people that he, he knows throughout the war that were also Hollywood connected who, who kind of draw him out to, to California. Um, and he starts to um, write a few more screenplays and a few more novels and that kind of thing and, and gets back into it slowly you, you mentioned you mentioned obviously in the first part of his life that obviously he was interested in writing and he wrote screenplays and he wrote a novel was there much uh from his early biography 
that suggested he had this like because with Kurosawa there's a lot of emphasis on um, his brother getting him into film how much he's go to cinema how much he's watched silent movies do you get any of that with Fuller is he a big film guy at this no point? not really he is he's a he's a newspaper man and that's what he wants to do he, he's in love with the machinery of newspapers he's in love with selling newspapers he's in love with the sensationalism of newspapers and sort of telling these stories. Uh, he, he actually says to begin with, he's not, hasn't got a lot of interest in fiction to begin with at all. Um, uh, he wants to write stories and he writes stories and the, the newspapers that he's written for and the stories that he's told are by their very nature sensationalist. And when and, he, when he, so when he wrote, and, if he's not got much interest in fiction, when he wrote a novel and he wrote screenplays, was that more because there were ways to make a buck? Like he was turning out things to make money. Partially, but also, um, you know, he was starting to understand from the small 250 words to the slightly longer form stories as he went around and kind of saw recurring themes and recurring problems in different places. He started to realize that he could tell longer stories and that um, the best way to get an audience to read those longer stories quite often is to fictionalize them. So his idea, he, what, he, what he started to, to, to do was to take the things that he was seeing and present them to people in a fictionalized way but it was still to him it was a form of reporting and because he came up through the yellow press because he's um uh this kind of uh, there were so many newspapers competing um and for the headline grabbing kind of thing uh he's got that very sensationalist way of 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 writing and it's very evident in a lot of his titles he's got two films at least that uh, two directed films, there's probably more that he's written with exclamation points in their titles. Uh, Verboten and Shark, both both finish with exclamation points. Um, but he's also got, um, you know, like this is this his first film that we're about to talk about, for example, I Shot Jesse James is a very kind of upfront, out there um, title. Um, Shock Corridor. Um, uh, the they naked sound pulpy, kiss. don't they? They sound, they, they they sound like pulp novel cover sort of titles. Yeah, and um, this is kind of where the kind of the A movie B movie thing comes in. So he, he's got a really respectable filmography by 1949, um, and what he but what he hasn't done is directed. And he hooks up with a guy called um, Robert uh, Lippert. This is so this is coming out of Lisa Lebowski. Uh, Robert Lippert, who has Lippert, who does Lippert Pictures, uh, and Lippert uh, Pictures uh, tagline at the time is "You get action from Lippert Pictures." So this was kind of like a B movie Western specialists, usually sixty sixty five minutes at most. A B pictures hundred thousand pound budgets. Um, What's happening at this time with sort of divorcement and that kind of thing as well is it's quite interesting here because they're, they're contemporary things is that um, studios, big studios are getting less and less interested in producing B pictures and um, um, uh, keep on forgetting the name. And Dombrowski argues that the blockbusters are already starting to come in, the, the, the Gone with the Winds and whatnot. And so there's an argument that the big studios only want to make big blockbusters and aren't interested in financing little films in 1949, which, you know, <laughs> brilliant. Um, uh, so what Lippert is trying to, trying to do is um, trying to make a bridge a gap, if you like, um, in the market between B pictures and A pictures, because there is this liminal space, these in-betweeners or programmers, as they were known, that may have maybe one big star or no big stars, or maybe they're just really good. And these are the ones that jump between A and B designation. And Lippert has kind of got this ambition to um, just put out a few more kind of in-betweeners, maybe move up from the very kind of... Um, bottom of the rung kind of B genre pitches and just try and ease out to get a few more hits and try and grow the company a little bit. And he's very taken by Sam Fuller's writing, despite the fact um, he's never written before. He's never directed before. And uh, Sam Fuller does a handshake deal, nothing written, apparently, a handshake deal to uh, direct his first film for Robert Lippert. Um, 
and that's where I shot Jesse James comes in. Am I right in thinking, or have I confused things here, that that this deal was some sort of, like, you pay for the script, but I'm going to direct it for free because I want to get the credit? Or did I completely it, it make it up? It's not quite for free. He did it for minimum wage. Um, right. Yeah, essentially. An honest day's work for an honest day's pay. And exactly. Shook hands. I just looked on Letterboxd. I organised him by writer. And some of these might be attributing ones where he ghost wrote them, but they've subsequently found um, that he wrote them. Uh, but before I shot Jesse James, Letterbox at least credits him with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, ten, eleven films. So yeah, he's he's written eleven films at least up to this point that we know of, which is um, quite a lot. Yeah, and and there's a heavy suggestion in his autobiography that some of the books that he wrote that he ghost wrote were for like. Um, Basically, they were detective novels for um, like series, and you know, like think of like a Philip Marlowe or a Sam Spade mm -hmm. or something like that. He was writing for one of those writers, like churning out um, franchise detective novels for for for, for famous writers as well. Um, yeah, so he, 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 he this is his first film. It's got a budget of one hundred and ten. Um, and it is um it's it's short it's 85 minutes but it's like 20 minutes longer than most lippet films usually okay. are and they're most lippet films are action films basically they're known for westerns at this point um and it says that he, he says um in his um his autobiography that he originally wanted to make a film about um claudius and julius caesar he wanted to make an assassination film but Lippert was like, no, we've that sounds expensive. We've already got all these <laughs> cowboy costumes and this like, yeah, you, shoot on. You've got ten days to film, basically. Um <clears throat> yeah. So uh he let's have a look. I've also got this book here, which is really nice. It's Sam Fuller interviews. Um I, these are all ebooks and I've printed off bits. Um uh he's so he he, he was interested in um uh, Jesse James, and this is from an interview in <clears throat> uh, 1968 with Eric Sherman and Martin Rubin. So this is from Sam Fuller's uh, mouth himself, and you'll get a sense uh, of what he says. He says, I'll make it very brief about Mr. Robert Ford. I happen to like Robert Ford because he did something that should have been done quite a bit earlier in the life of Jesse Woodson James. <laughs> 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 I'm going to admit uh, I'm going to admit some stuff here because it's there's a little so there's some out, outdated uh, some very outdated offensive language that he uses here. Uh, uh, Jesse James uh, Jesse James acted as a hooker, enticed soldiers into a little shack called the House of Love, where these bastards bastard raiders robbed the soldiers and killed them. When he was 18, Jesse and his brother held up a hospital train, wherein they robbed all the casualties and killed them. Since I despise Mr. James, who I'd give my right eyeball to make the I would give my right eyeball to make the true story of Jesse James. I'll always have sympathy for Mr. Robert Ford. One day the real story of Jesse James will be made. It will shock people. Rough, vicious. This is have, so strange. We have the... young squirts today who are supposed to be under the spell of narcotics and they hold up banks and mug women. They're cream puffs compared to these old guys. <laughs> <laughs> they knocked off people immediately. Wow. This is really odd because I don't want to jump the gun too much to talk about the film, but the depiction of Jesse James in this film is this sort of, he should be played by Henry Fonda or so. He's like this, he's like this kindly old Abraham Lincoln looking guy who <laughs> moves really slowly and speaks really delicately. And at the beginning of the film, he like saves Robert Ford from being killed. And he's like, he's just shown to be this lovely, wholesome family man. So to find out that uh, actually this was partly motivated by the fact that Sam Fuller hated Jesse James is weird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's what he's that's what he's put there. Uh, but you get a little sense of um, I'm not very good at, uh, at funny accents or anything like that, so I can't do the big gruff kind of. But uh, yeah, it does sound like a cigar chomping old old Hollywood guy for sure. Yeah, um, and it kind of gives you. I think you know part of it was like obviously Jesse James is in it. We'll, we'll start talking about the film in a second. But the reason it's I shot Jesse James is to is is like a low budget marketing trick basically to get people in um because um yeah it's not a, it's it's dressed up as a western but it's not an action film that you might expect from lippert pictures it says here um 
So one more quote from me. I did. That's why I didn't want any horsemanship in the picture. After we finished talking about it being about the psychology of Robert Ford and a Ford and about an assassination. Uh, after we finished shooting, Leppard put in some stock shots of people riding around. I didn't want that. I'm not interested in a horse story. It's not very different concept <laughs> from Kurosawa. Yeah. I'm not even interested in Jesse. I'm interested in Ford and how difficult it must be for an assassin to kill somebody, especially someone he knows. How difficult. And then, uh, yeah. So, yeah, should we talk about the film a little bit? Yeah, I um, I want to say one thing about it right off because we talked already about this kind of weird space between A and B and where this quite fits in. Um, the only actor from this film that I actually recognised is the guy who plays Robert Ford who's called John Ireland. And the reason I recognise him is because he's got really minor parts in Red River, My Darling Clementine and Spartacus that I kind of recognised him from. And in fact, I remember in, in, in My Darling Clementine and possibly also in Red River, though I'm not certain, he just plays like one of the toughs, I think. Like, I don't even think he's like the main bad guy. I think yeah. he's like one of the bad guy's brothers, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's interesting because it's kind of, this guy's the star of this film, but he's like a, a reliable fifth banana in other westerns you know it's well it's like, difficult it's difficult without being there at the time because he talks about um hiring um robert ireland as a uh, john ireland as as kind of you know the uh, 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 being a little bit bankable but it would be like maybe somebody sitting down in um 70 years time to to talk about like um sam worthington or jai courtney <laughs> like yeah they had a moment they did have a moment but uh uh, you know, no, the, the legacy of them is, um, I don't know, I'm not really aware of, to be honest. Yeah, no, it's possible, obviously, he starred in some other sort of low-rent westerns around that time, but is yeah, it's it's um, it's interesting. I mean, he's the only person that I actually recognised, apart from, as I said, Jesse James looks like Abraham Lincoln, but uh, <laughs> I know that he's not. So, so, so we've uh, done the set. We've done the setup, and I think on on uh, the um, Kurosawa cast, I usually you used to usually hand it over me to go through the plot uh, before we started talking about the film in detail. So, yeah, okay. So this one, if you've seen, um, it's really interesting. This is really just in coincidental trivia more than any serious academic thing. But it's interesting that both the films I've seen about this have a spoiler as the title because this was I shot Jesse James and then the other one which this bears a lot of similarity to is the assassination of Jesse James by the car of Robert Ford so it's interesting that movies about the death of Jesse James sort of have to put out there that like exactly what happens in the title and I wonder if it's because in the kind of American myth making and everything this story is obviously much more famous maybe in America than it is mm. in the UK because this whole thing of him being shot looking at that painting and there being this tour watching him sort of reenact shooting him doing his painting on stage which is something that happens in both films i guess this must be a story americans are very familiar with that they're watching played out whereas for me as someone that basically knows nothing about jesse james it's it's um it's it is kind of a spoiler not that that matters but you just i don't know anything about these people but um yeah the story basically is the same as the story for the assassination just James by current run forward for about the first 40 minutes uh, and you get kind of almost all of that Andrew Dominic like three hour movie in the first 40 minutes where you get um, Jesse James as part of um, Robert Ford rather as part of Jesse James gang. Um, Jesse James like saves him in some scrapes and they're clearly good buddies. But then Robert Ford finds out that maybe he's in trouble and he can get out of it by, um, uh, you know, there's like a reward, a, an amount of money that he can get. He sees maybe he'll be treated as a big hero if he kills Jesse James. So he decides in want of this other life because um in this version of the telling, he's got this uh, woman he wants to go off and marry. He decides he can have this wonderful life with this woman he wants to marry. If he bumps off Jesse James and he takes the money for the reward. So he shoots Jesse James while he's hanging up a picture. Um, he instead doesn't get that reward because everyone thinks he's an absolute scumbag. And he spends the rest of the film with people basically denigrating him, spitting on him, singing songs about how he's a dick, just basically jeering him as he goes around on a sort of shambolic tour uh, reenacting this event, uh, being quite sad and depressed and angry about the whole thing. Uh, the woman that he did it all so he could have this life with, she's also rejected him because she's like, why would I want to kill this guy that struck Jesse James in the back? She's got almost the same opinion of his actions as everybody else, although not quite because there's still a sort of suggestion they could sort of end up together for most of the film. Um, and then this other fella turns up, and this is where it kind of takes a, a weird turn from... <laughs> The historical basis where um 
in reality, I've written down the names because I don't know these people. Super Kelly. Well. Ke it's Kelly, but in real life, because this is where it becomes really obviously fictionalized. In real life, I think it's a guy called Edward O. Kelly. And if you yeah. look at a picture of Edward O. Kelly on Wikipedia, he is not a handsome man. He's got like <laughs> kind of a, a misshapen face, everything like that. And in the in the Andrew Dominic film, I think he is played by an actor who's kind of a bit kind of grim face looking, slightly scary. In this film, he's now John Kelly, and he's really handsome movie star, and he's just a swell guy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the rest of the film, the rest of the film ends up being about. Um, Preston Preston Foster's the name of the actor. Yeah, and basically the rest of the film ends up being about this thing of um, rather than it being in the Dominic film, and presumably real life, I don't know this story very well, but rather than it being this idea that this Edward O'Kelly guy goes and shoots him as part of this ongoing cycle of people wanting to make this notorious killing and people hating this guy because he killed Jesse James, he turns it into this story of these two people who are sort of fighting over the same woman and yeah, takes, kind of. I mean, yeah. I think the idea is that after he's he's committed this murder, he's obsessed with. He's done it for um, uh, Cynthia, the, this woman that he's in love with, to to build a life for, her. and he spends his time going off sort of silver mining and trying to get the money together so she can build a life. And she's basically because of his actions, fallen out of love with him and can't tell him. Um, she's scared of him to a certain degree as well. So he's he's desperately trying to build this life for a woman who doesn't want it for, for, for the second half of the film. And then he, uh, it's, um, uh, it, it gets to the point where, um, Frank James, uh, I think it's Frank James, Jesse's yeah. brothers goes on trial and then he comes out and everyone's convinced that he's going to kill Robert Ford. But instead he just walks into the bar with a gun and says, by the way, she doesn't love you. She loves someone else. Deal with that, and then <laughs> and then leaves. Yeah, <laughs> in the cruelest way possible. Um, but yeah, it's that's the second half of the film, pretty much, isn't and you, it? It's, you get yeah, more or less, and you get sort of stock characters come into it. Where you remember in uh, in a lot of John Wayne westerns, there's usually like a Walter Brennan character who's like the kind of town drunk. Who, who kind of hiccups and drinks a lot yeah. and they're all like oh lumpy or whatever he's always got like a soapy name. in this one yeah in this one it's soapy and it's this guy that just isn't as good as walter brennan at all he's like the worst film drunk i've ever seen in my life and uh yeah so soapy comes in and you start to get like these stock characters like to give my overall sort of take on the film i really feel like the first half of it the first 40 50 minutes of this like 80 minute movie it's so tight it's really interesting. It does most of what the Dominic one does, but in like a third of the time. And then it turns into something a bit more conventional and a bit more silly in a way because it becomes this love story and this kind of it lost. It becomes me a bit. it becomes sort of this uh, bit of a it becomes a bit of a melodrama, sort of slightly yeah. slightly John Houston-y. Um also this kind of melodrama kind of adventure outdoorsy kind of thing. Um uh, it, it's a uh, it's a, you know, he's going, to, he, Fuller's definitely going for sort of psychodrama about trying to, because I think, I mean, the ultimate kind of end goal is that basically the reason that Bob Ford is so obsessive about making this life with Cynthia is his, is his regret for actually killing his friend. Like, he, it needs to mean something. He needs mm. to build the life in order to justify what he's done. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what it's all about, which is what which, which is what Fuller says he, he intended to go out and make was a was a, like a character analysis of 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 somebody who would assassinate a friend. Um, but yeah, the, the pace of it was to begin with was incredible. I I made some notes here. So by um, in twelve minutes. In the first 12 minutes, first of all, there's this great opening scene in the bank, like this cold open scene where there, you, you you kind of, you're in there mid robbery, guns are being pointed at people, people are looking at people, there is a alarm bell on the floor, there is a teller sweating trying to set off this alarm and there, it's about to kick off, basically. It's a really tense, tight scene and the, the alarm goes off and they shoot people and they run out and Bob Ford drops the money so they get away with nothing. Um, but Jesse's kind of like, Look, don't worry about it. So 
that's within the first three or four minutes you set up this kind of slightly protective relationship like he, jesse doesn't kind of go mad or or ostracize him or punish him for his cock up he just kind of like no we're friends um then you kind of go then bob's hiding out with with jesse's family and you kind of immediately see that his wife is irritated with bob being there and there's like a there's a tension in the house i have a note about this part of the film yeah. which is that it's not the shit stained west because in the yeah. dominic one it's very much people in those like dirty white onesies with the like bum flap on the back and yeah. everything looks like it's covered in shit this looks like really kind of gentrified clean lovely little house that they live in here then then you, you're introduced to Cynthia, who's like this showgirl actress. And there is a suggestion that the, the, the proprietor of the show, Harry Kane, uh, is trying to introduce her to wealthy, wealthy investors. So there is this suggestion that she's al almost on the verge of being pimped. Um, uh, and that she wants to give up and get out of this. Um yeah, was then, was her being was her being an actress a kind of a euphemism for her being a prostitute in the film, or were they not allowed at this point in 1949 to have her just be a prostitute in a in a saloon? I don't know. I don't think. I don't think that was the. I think the intention was not. Even if they were allowed, I think it was still the suggestion that they're 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 teetering on on the edge. I think that was the. There was a there was a, a you know like there was narrative tension being put in there deliberately. Right. That her life could spiral down this bad path, and she needs sort of some yeah. intervention. And right, that, and okay. that, and Bob is the one, and that sh her and Bob are in love, and they want to create a new life and create a new plan. And then by seventeen, and that's all in the first twelve minutes. And by the seventeenth minute, uh, the information comes through that any member of the gang who brings in Jesse James, dead or alive, will get uh, ten thousand dollar reward and amnesty from their crimes so you've got that entire tension and all this stuff set up very very quickly it's such it's yeah. so speedy so so speedy it's so um it's really economical yeah it really is there's actually just because it's a, a note i have from that beginning of the film um it's still just a kind of a walk-on part i'm not making any great claims for it but there's also a black supporting character that comes in at one point who doesn't speak in the uh, kind of patois that they normally give black movie characters in the 40s. Like, I love, for example, Preston Sturgis movies, but every Preston Sturgis movie from the 40s, they speak in that particular way that I'm obviously not going to imitate. Uh, and um, she, she, they don't do that at all. This is actually, she's not anyone's maid. She's not played to be anything in particular, like a type. She's just, I don't know if this, you might know from his biography, whether Sam Fuller was a quite quite a progressive person or quite a, you know, or something like that. But it did seem to me to be a very different black role than you tend to get in the forties. Funny thing is when you read his biography is there are, and when you read those interviews as well from the sixties, you know, I deliberately left some bits and pieces out there. Um, and there are moments where he is, he comes across as cantankerous and a little bit bigoted, but he has said he, there are bits where he is like decried equally from both sides as either a fascist or a wet a liberal mm. or a communist basically it seems that he has got a very kind of um he's not he's not a partisan in any way shape or form he's kind of developed his own opinions about lots of things and isn't afraid to upset people who might agree with him on one issue he's not afraid to disagree with them on another um uh but he's He's clearly anti-fascist in the way that he talks about, um, you know, why he was fighting in the war and that kind of thing. He, you know, he's, he talks about, um, there's quite a harrowing section where he was part of a, a group that, that um, liberated a concentration camp. Um, and he talks about how that deeply affected him as well. Um, yeah. So, you know, he's, 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 um, a complicated figure. You wouldn't be able to sum him up in. You wouldn't be able to sum him up in a tweet. Basically. No. <laughs> there's um, there's a scene coming up, I think, just after where you've gotten to, when uh, when Bob Ford has has been told about this reward potentially, and he starts kind of almost killing Jesse James, but then tricking checking it out at the last minute. He can't quite do it in the bath. And 
the, the bathtub scene. The bathtub scene is my favorite scene in the whole film, but not necessarily because of what it is, but because of what I want it to be. Because there, there's a bit where he's kind of in the bath and he keeps asking Bob Ford to, like, I don't know, pass him things, say, Oh, stand behind me here for a second. Hold this <laughs> blade. Give me a shave. You know, whatever. He just keeps giving things. I want him to be like, uh, Hey, hey, Bob! Can you bring that toaster over here and put it on the side? I want to make some toast. You know, I just really wanted it to just keep taking these extremes because it does seem like he keeps just giving these like opportunities to be shot and drowned and stabbed. Yeah, there's <laughs> also a great musical. There's a great musical sting when you first see his back as well. Like, uh, da shoot him in the back. He, he does mention in his. Um, in, in some of his, in his autobiography that there are some sort of homoerotic undertones that he managed to sneak past Robert Lippert. I, I was going to say that and I kind of didn't because I thought, well, am I just kind of reading that into it? But at the beginning when Jesse James takes Robert Ford, um, when they when he saves him from the bank, there's yeah. a very tender scene with quite a bit of sexual tension towards them where Jesse James is like placing his hand maybe even under his shirt to see if he's wounded. And then that whole scene in the bathroom and him looking at this nut bare back and everything, it definitely does feel to me like there's a sexual tension between them and i wasn't sure if that was a deliberate thing apparently it was which is really interesting <laughs> yeah definitely he he says that it's um you know he, he describes it as a definite subtext but not really something that it's not uh supposed to be the main focus at all it's kind of he talks about a platonic love between the two two men that is betrayed um but but also is um but also perhaps troubles Bob Ford a little bit. Um, so yeah, th that's definitely in there. Um, I don't know if I don't know if this has anything to do with um, Sam Fuller's love of newspapers and his time in newspapers. But I I don't know if there's another film in existence, certainly not one I've seen, that has as many newspaper headlines spinning at the camera as this one does. This this, this takes the piss with it. I have a scene where like four come up back to back and they all show you had a criticism sometimes of Kurosawa where you felt things were being sort of told to us that would have been quite interesting to see. These newspapers, and maybe it's a budget and a time thing, but these newspapers are always coming up going, some incredible things just <laughs> there is definitely i think that is that is something that you'll see more of throughout his films um it was definitely a time and a budget thing uh so he's he he's a lot of things that um a lot of his kind of stylistic traits if you like is he loves a montage to sort of he's he talks about being impatient as well in his um uh, very impatient in his autobiography so he he likes to get stuff across quickly you'll get moments like that audio sting of, of the back because he has these kind of shots or moments that are like headlines, like, you know, that are thrown onto the screen as in, in a headline kind of attention grabbing fashion. And you'll get a lot of long takes as well. And so he, he apparently he used to shoot a lot of singles once. And um, so the editors had no options. Like it's it's there, and that's what you've got to use. Clint Eastwood's like that, isn't he? Doesn't Clint Eastwood famously yeah. shoot things in one take when he can and just move on? Yeah, um, and then and so things are often kind of uh, used. They had to use optical zooms occasionally to 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 cut around things. Um, so an optical zoom is where you punch in on you punch in on the on 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 the negative, but you obviously increase the grain, and it's it's not. Mm ideal um but he you know he's, he's an expedient kind of director um this was shot in 10 days um so it, there is a definite element of they didn't have time to to do everything as well so long takes single takes montages keep it moving keep it rapid um the title sequence which is a load of wanted posters and then the titles on a board and the camera kind of moves around them uh, was shot on the last day because they ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they just found the quickest and easiest way to do it because there was no money left. It's to, a good to, title to sequence. Some... It is, so isn't it's, it? It's one of those things like, you know, the, the shark not being very realistic in Jaws or whatever, where the workaround for it is probably more interesting than what they'd have done if they had the money. Exactly. Um, yeah, and, and the long takes, they're, they're very static in this because of... Um, Budget, re budget reasons in his first directing, but he, he it's something apparently that maintains throughout his career. And but um, 
as the budgets increase a little bit and his experience increases, those long takes become a little bit more dynamic, um, much like the kind of uh, the Spielberg wanna, if uh, if you've seen the um, yes, the every frame of painting on that, yeah, yeah. So long takes and montages uh, and sort of real kind of um, putting a hat on a hat for certain moments are, are the things that you get. He's not, I mean, there's more subtlety in his films than first glance because he's quite morally complex and he's, he doesn't really like to condemn anybody. Um so his his films are quite morally complex, but they're those sort of stylistic things that I think are already in here um, to begin mm. with. Um, yeah, so we got as far as as the. I I love the thing about the um, it, during the the assassination scene because you see it before as well. There's this painting on the wall that's crooked, and a couple of times Jesse James tries to straighten it, and it immediately goes crooked again. And he does that during the assassination. I don't know why I like that, but it was just a really nice little bit of detail in this non shit covered version of the west um, yeah <laughs> yeah no I, I like those scenes and the, the first half of the film i feel like because i gave it a, a two and a half and a box in the end because by the end i'd sort of um soured on the kind of last 20 or 30 minutes of it but let's talk talking again about the beginning half of it i do think it's really excellently done and i i really love the pacing of it i think i think and in a way it was kind of a victim i think in my mind of how great it starts because the pacing is so great, and then it kind of felt like it ground to a bit of a halt. Mm. Um, maybe maybe that pacing ideally is reversed, where you sort of start slow and then build to something. But it felt like I really built up and then got something quite drawn out after the fact, which was kind mm. of a bit odd to me. I mean, there are some nice bits after the assassination, but the mm. assassination sort of... Could, there's this bit where um, he's gambling. There's a couple of scenes. There's a bit where he's gambling with somebody in a saloon. And the guy is the guy he's gambling win, with is deliberately losing the card game, like lying about that he's got a lower card to keep Bob talking and get the details about the assassination, which is really nice. Um, the bit where he, he goes up to do the traveling show as well, and all the people are looking at him, and he get he gets stage fright and chickens out is is nicely done with lots of cuts up shows of faces in a probably. Sp- Probably Super. my favorite, my favorite post assassination scene is when he's in a bar and a guy just starts singing a song about how Robert Ford's a dick, and uh, Robert Ford stands up and he's like, "I'm Robert Ford, sing the song to me." Well, he, well, he pays kind of... him to he pays him to sing a song, and the guy says, "Here's one everybody <laughs> loves," doesn't yeah. he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of even even better. But basically, like, um, what was really great I thought about that scene is is there's a there's a really great tension. Where it kind of cuts shot reverse shot between the guy looking really nervous singing the song and then cutting to Robert Ford just staring at him, you know. And and ultimately it doesn't come to violence. Like Robert Ford listens to the song and walks out. But you do feel like maybe he's gonna shoot this guy, like maybe something's gonna happen. And there is a bit yeah. of tension there that I really liked. Yeah, that it's a that is a really fantastic scene. And the rest of the film, the sort of the next 35 minutes, 30 minutes, or or the rest of it is all about the kind of psychology and him trying to build himself back and not being able to do it. There's a bit where he, he, so Soapy is like a silver. The second half of the film takes place in Creed, Colorado, where he, where Robert Ford's eventually shot or was shot as well, and it's about him silver prospecting to try and make this money. And Soapy is a is an old drunk prospector who's just struck silver, and he comes into the bar and he's all whoopty whoop, and a bunch of people kind of want to take him out or find out where his his vein of silver is, and um. Robert Ford kind of shoots one of them who's about to shoot Soapy in the back and then gives him this lecture about how he hates cowards who shoot people who aren't armed. And it's like, <laughs> he's got this kind of, he's, he's trying, he, he's like, it's, the rest of the film is like him trying to atone basically and try and pull back his moral um, authority. And then that's immediately followed by him going outside and getting shot at by an un- unseen gunfighter uh, uh, who, who um, shoots at him a few times and misses and then says, don't shoot, I haven't got any bullets left as he comes out. Um, and it's this kid who just wants to kill him to get the title of the man who shot Robert Ford, uh, mm. which is kind of what you were saying about the cycle of violence. But it it becomes less interested in that and more about... It, 
Robert Ford not being able to um, marry um, the lady. Yeah, and which was like for me the least interesting part of the film. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I think after, I think after uh, the 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 last really interesting scene for me was um, the bit where he's sitting with Soapy and they're mining, and then he pulls a gun and shoots, and it cuts away, and then you find out that what he's done is shoot a mountain lion um, that was about to attack Soapy and not killed Soapy, but he shot something. But it cuts away and kind of as a viewer, you'll think it kind of, you still don't trust him. You've seen him not, you've seen him save Soapy and, and shoot this other guy in the arm, not kill him, but shoot him in the arm. You've seen him let the kid walk free and then you've seen him work with Soapy, but you're still thinking that this guy could be is an arsehole. He might kill somebody in, in cold blood. Um, and that was nice, I thought. That that worked really yeah. nicely. Maybe really we could well have done. seen the mountain lion, but maybe they didn't have the money for a mountain maybe lion. Maybe they didn't have the money, yeah. And that, that might be, I was going to say, it might be that we got a really nice, ambiguous cut there because of, again, budget limitations. Um, something I wanted to say there's like, uh, at the very end of the film, there's this setup where um, the, uh, what's, what's he called again? Is it Kelly? Where Kelly has uh, a gun, he's been told that you know Bob Ford's on the warpath to kind of come and because uh, he's heard about him and the other the, you know his woman doesn't love him and he blames Kelly for this, so he's kind of coming out with a kind of a view to shooting Kelly, I think, and um, they end up having this sort of almost standoff type thing in this kind of long street, and there's a couple of things in that scene that are really strange, and I don't know if there's one of them might be a stylistic choice that just didn't work for me, which is that it's in daytime in all of the like like big shots, but then whenever it's a close up of Robert Ford, he's like in pitch blackness, which stylistically is interesting, but the rest of the film doesn't really use any sort of like stylized lighting or anything strange like that. So it's really weird. It keeps coming from like daylight to like pitch black between these two things. And then you also get this like hand shoots first bollocks that happens where where the uh, um, you know obviously there's that discussion about Han Solo where in the special yeah. editions they ruined it by having the the guy that's like two feet away from him miss. That's actually just what happens in the original cut of this film. Uh, the the first person to fire is uh, is Robert Ford from like an inch away. Uh, and he somehow just shoots over the guy's shoulder. I guess we could look at it and say that the psychology is that it's actually him committing suicide, like death by cop or something. But it did seem to me like um, a slightly... Uh, yeah, if that's sequence. the point, it's not... It's uncharacteristically not hammered home, you know, because mm. he gets him in the shoulder. Um, and then his dying words are, um, like, I loved him, you know. Or something like that, wasn't it? About, about yeah. Jesse. Um, and then we're out after 81 minutes. And that's that's something that is quite, uh, you know, he rarely makes films longer than 90 minutes, Sam Fuller. He's he's in and out and done and on mm. to the next thing. So broadly speaking, you say you gave it a sort of a two and a half to begin. I mean, the critical response to this film, just while I remember. So it was, it was a bit of a, a hit. Like it did well, it, it more than made its money back, um, and uh, a few places started running it as an A picture as well, um, especially in New York City. Um, but also, he immediately had um, some uh, critical acclaim right from the off. So um, this is from his autobiography. I had no idea that audiences from other countries would love the film too. It got picked up, subtitled, and played around the world. A French critic wrote that the close-ups in my movie had an impressive intensity that cinema had not experienced since dry as Joan of Arc. The critic's name was Jean-Luc Godard. <laughs> <laughs> so the French love That's him. like, to me, for this podcast, knowing what you know about my thoughts on Jean-Luc Godard, <laughs> that's like the end of Batman Begins where Commissioner Gordon hands over the Joker <laughs> Um, yeah, that doesn't surprise me because obviously a lot of I was talking at the beginning about these B movies that kind of gained this um, critical glow beyond their original status in a lot of cases, and a lot of that came from the Kaya's group, didn't it? And the yeah. the kind of looking back and re reappraising things like fifties noirs and Night of the Hunter and Nicholas Ray and all of that sort of aspect. So and I it's can, interesting I can that see that. 
and it's interesting that the new new Hollywood directors who were uh, who were in turn influenced by that group, um, like so the forward for his autobiography, for example, is written by Martin Scorsese. So, like, the people who came after Sam Fuller had obviously been mm. turned on to Sam Fuller by the French. Yeah, well. and you've got as well because I've seen uh, I've seen Sam Fuller in uh, Peril of Food, the Godard film where he plays himself, but he's also in uh, Wim Wenders, The American Friend. He's in Spielberg's 1941 in a minor role. He's in Dennis Hopper's The Last Movie. So he does turn up in a lot of things by people from New Hollywood and other kind of, obviously when Renders isn't New Hollywood, but from a sort of a later set who um, who obviously were inspired by him and have a reverence for him. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll I get onto that. We'll get onto that later um, when we when we work through his his career um, because he did he did do he, he did spend much of his late career in Europe um and 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 getting funded and, and shooting in europe as well so we, we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll get onto that in good time that's really interesting because i was going to say obviously we came off of kurosawa doing this and like we said at the beginning there's a there's a lot of differences here between these two characters and the types of films they made and their place in the canon and how well known they are but there are some maybe superficial similarities i mean that sounds like another one which is later in his career he got funding kind of going to europe and all that kind of thing um and, and obviously getting kind of lifted up by some of this new set who are um fans of his work but you've also got the fact that um kurosawa's first films were in the kind of mid to late 40s as a sam fuller's sam fuller's last film is in the 90s which was obviously also the case for kurosawa uh so there's a kind of an interesting sort of we're covering films in a very similar span and there's kind of a similar number of them as well, right? Like I think maybe he made like five less than Kurosawa, but it's mm. uh, it's an interesting thing because it's almost this career that we're looking through is almost running exactly parallel to the other one we were looking at. Yeah, absolutely. So we and and we've got like there's a similar kind of um, trajectory as well in in terms of budget and who he is working for. So this uh, Robert Lippert um, production. So he he directed and wrote this one as he did uh, the, his next film, um, The Baron of Arizona. So I shot Jesse James as 48, Baron of Arizona is 1949. He's, he's knocking them out quickly. Uh, and then he makes, uh, uh, I think he makes uh, one more film. Um, oh, I haven't got the, yeah, he makes one more film. I, I deleted some of the pages from my preview just to, make it easier to get through he makes uh, and three films for Lippert. so he makes the baron of arizona and then the steel helmet after that and then mm. uh, new stage of his career so um yeah it's that's... it's interesting obviously we'll get to it when we get to it but it's interesting that steel helmet is so early in his career because that film is really polished like i remember watching that and just thinking it stood up as a a great movie in its own right in a way i don't think is necessarily true of this first film but it's interesting that what is you said that's his third did you yeah, third. So that's film. like that's like two films on from this. I think that's quite amazing. Um, yeah, I'm also intrigued because you've obviously covered in his biography that he spent time in in the war, and that obviously touches on some of the films he made, like Steel Helmet, like the big red one. Um, but there's this whole other aspect to his life where he's going around in the Great Depression. He's a crime reporter. He's on trains of hobos. And I'm wondering if any of that stuff ends up in any of his movies, like directly, or whether it just underpins his philosophy and informs the way he views life. I, I just wonder if he tackles any of that kind of thing. Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely some of that coming up as well. So, you know, there are he's got uh, a number of films um uh coming up later on, specifically Park Row, which was self financed. And then later, the big red one, which is his kind of magnum opus, originally heavily cut, um, and then uh, restored after his death to like a four-hour film, like his only real epic. Um, they're the really deeply personal ones that are kind of semi-autobiographical, um, but everything else um, is is. Um, you know, it's massively informed by his 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 time as a uh, as a reporter, in his style, in the way that he in in his in his politics, in his um, the philosophy of of his films is massively influenced by those years spent uh, sort of on the fringes of the underworld mm. and, and jumping on boxcars. 
Interesting. Yeah, yeah I'm going to have fun watching these. I think as well, uh, obviously we're both fans of people that can get a film made in under 80 minutes or under 90 minutes. So uh, good to see. You say there's a four-hour cut of Big Red One because the standard's about two, right? Yeah. So are we going to be able to see this four-hour cut? Is that around? I think that was the I think that's the Criterion uh, one. It was it was released right. in two thousand and four at Cannes. Um, I think it's four hours long. Let's have a look. Interesting. Uh, I'm looking forward. But that to one is available. Yeah. And um, you know, if he's gonna if we're gonna be watching sort of twenty ninety minute films, I'll let him. I'll let him have a four hour one. He can have one. Yeah, he can have one for sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, yeah, doing this, we're both obviously working through a lot of these kind of films in the canon on these lists. There are a lot of them over three hours that don't have any business being over three hours. I'll give that time to like Sam Fuller to make like a hard edged war movie. That's, that's oh no, funny. it's only three hours by the looks of things. It's only three okay. hours. So, you know, I'm actually quite disappointed. It's only three <laughs> hours. Uh, but yeah, that's interesting as well. That's um, that's like by far his, um, uh, uh, but it's it's the most uh, i mean i don't and maybe it's not again because like we're saying um it's difficult to judge because you you weren't around at the time you don't necessarily know who these actors are if they didn't have longevity to their careers they might have been they might have had a moment that you could only really recognize if you were there but like the 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 cast for big red one is like lee marvin robert carradine uh and um mark hamill um who in 1980, Mark Hamill, um, you know, so post um, Star Wars, well, and in the Empire middle Strikes, of Star Wars, yeah, in the middle of Star Wars, yeah, yeah, uh, interesting. I'm just looking at the Baron of Arizona, the next film, and um, we've got a little bit more star quality right off the bat because it stars Vincent Price, apparently. So that's somebody at least everybody's heard of, even if apparently I haven't really seen any Vincent Price films when I look at him on that box. <laughs> Yeah, it's an in, interesting one for uh, for Vincent Price because Vincent Price um, famously, uh, you know, he it, there's a film with he, you know he's he's known as a horror actor and he 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 always wanted to be a great thespian uh, and there's a great film from uh, the seventies called Theatre of Blood that he loved doing because it was about a failed actor who uh, killed all his critics in. Um, a kind of like a kind of like the jigsaw killer but um taking scenes from shakespeare <laughs> so i would imagine although i've not i'm going to keep my reading up to the point we're at and i'm, mm. I'm trying to watch the films before i do the reading so i can get an unbiased view on them i can imagine that uh, it would be one that vincent price very much enjoyed making as a western and and not having to be a uh uh, a horror character but yeah yeah very interesting it's uh it's quite low in terms of sorted by popularity on letterboxd it's quite low down vincent price's filmography this one so kind of a little scene film it looks like we also get our first griff in this one which i'll talk about a little bit more in the next uh, episode as well our first griff what does that mean first character called griff <laughs> so interesting okay excellent i'm looking forward to understanding the significance yeah. of that Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think we should probably wrap it up there. Um, yeah. Um, and then we will see you next time for uh, the Baron of Arizona. Excellent. See you next time. Bye bye.